All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a discussion of the Spiff Box semifinalists. And at the end of this video, we are going to reveal the finalists for our group. And we are very excited about this. I am actually very much looking forward to chatting with each of these wonderful individuals about the semifinalists that they sent to me, because that's how this worked. I have a, a wonderful team here. Uh, each individual was assigned uh, six books and eventually uh, whittled th those six down to one semifinalist, uh, which I got to read. And among those uh, five semifinalists, I had to choose the finalist, which was one of the hardest things I've ever done. But we do what we have to do, right, guys? Uh, so um, I'm Absolutely. very excited to discuss. We're gonna the way this is gonna work today is I'm gonna to uh, speak individually with uh, in the order I read the books in uh, with my 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 team, and uh, then I'm going to reveal the finalists at the end. And I do want to acknowledge Matt from Go Read Books is uh, not here. Uh, uh, he had something very important to attend to, and so he is doing that. He's where he should be right now. Uh, so I will do my best to represent uh, his book, uh, which is Troll Grave by Alex Bradshaw. And also I want to acknowledge Angela from Do Unicorns Read, who was initially a member of our team, but also needed to take care of some important things in her life. And so was very understandably unable to uh, participate with us. Um, but uh, I, I thank her for being a willing member of the team and hopefully we'll hear more from her. Um, so that being said, I also want to thank you for uh, and along, of course, with Matt, uh, who couldn't be here, thank you so much for doing this for me. You, you made this a lot, a lot. I can't emphasize because I did this first year. I did this. I read all yeah. 30 books by thank myself. You. And then I read all the other finalists as well. So that was a, a huge task. And 39 books. Jeez. 39 books in total wow. for SPF 9 uh, So you doing this for has made a tremendous difference. And I want to thank you because this is something we all do as a volunteer service to support indie fantasy. This is this is in, entirely, we get nothing from this except the joy of reading and sharing story together. Uh, so I'm really grateful to you. And I know that the vast majority of the authors are as well. Uh, the, the authors whose books you've read and talked about and engaged with. Uh, I, I have got so much gracious feedback from authors, authors whose books I did not make a semifinalist. We're still thanking me for talking about their books. And, and uh, that's just a beautiful part of this contest, the uh, community. So I wanna thank you for being a part of it. Cool. So that said, let us roll here. Uh, let's begin with the first of the semifinalists that I read and that is South Breaks. That's me, that's, that's me. That's yes, Vaughn has sent me South Breaks by Hannah Steenbach. And that is the first one I read. And I'm going to read the description that you would find on the back of the book. And then I'm going to ask Vaughn what he loves about South Breaks. So South's days are numbered after serving and protecting the Holy Empire for 25 years. She is facing the ultimate sacrifice, giving up her life on the top of a pyramid. Fate intervenes in the shape of a nameless guide, a clever mule, and a rockfall. Soon, South's mind is reeling from all she is learning about herself and her powers. Dealing with loss while building a new life, she has to risk everything she gained to save someone else. This is the first book in a large set of two series, Winds of Destiny, Pillars of the Empire, exploring the magic of the Holy Empire as well as the winds and the pillars who serve it. Meet shamans, mages, and priests, find out who is on the side of good and who chooses evil, and dive into a world that will get more complex with every new book all right so there it is Vaughn what was it that you loved what was it that about this book that spoke to you um this book really right from the start swept me in um it was uh what I loved about it is the world building is really unique I thought and um it was never overtly distributed it to me it was woven in beautifully the we meet our protagonist right away in uh, right in the middle of action and you get just the the right amount of world building as you move along very briskly through the the opening um i would say i think i read about oh a third of this book in one sitting uh just because i was so wrapped up in it and um i just thought it, it felt very, uh, I think I told you, Philip, that it felt very Mesoamerican. Like, yes, uh, I agree. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Aztecs or Incas or something. But there was 
there's human sacrifice, there's these pyramids, there, there are nearby jungles, uh, and then these high priests. And uh, South, our protagonist, is being taken away, as, as she says in the description, on a, on a clever mule. And that was another thing I loved about this book, where the animal companions were really unique. Um, you don't get too many mules <laughs> for an animal companion. And uh, there it's was a little a, monkey as well. I don't think that's monkey, a big monkey. Yeah. That's not, yeah, that's not, that, that monkey kept reminding me of Indiana Jones, but, uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I felt like uh, I was pretty, the, the craftsmanship and in introduction was, was pretty seamless. Um, and I, and I felt carried through um, the atmosphere of the, it was just dripping with atmosphere. It's uh it felt kind of fable-like, uh, the prose. It's very punchy. The prose is very uh, short sentences, short paragraphs, short chapters. So it's just, I mean, it keeps you moving. And that's not, all, it's not a necessity for me or anything like that. It just, it went with this story so well. Mm -hmm. um, South, you find out things about her past. She's, uh, she's a mystery even to herself. And her connection to her magic is a mystery, um, and it's just you gotta you gotta get to you to the end to figure figure it out, and you just want to know. I, I just was really invested throughout. Um, it's uh, you know, it reads it, it's about a young character, and it, at times it reads a little bit YA. But I've got to say, it's very spicy. It's, it's it awesome. is spicy, yes, yes. <laughs> but in a way, that's not in a way that I found to be very. How do how do you put this? Um, in a way that was very honest and very yeah. human, very very human. I felt. Yeah. Like, yes, there's sex in the story, but it's never the sort of thing that you would come across that's supposed to be titillating or anything like that. It's just right. very earthy, very honest, uh, very very human uh in a way that i found actually uh, you know i it, i like the way that it was written in there um, yeah it, it's it's integral to the plot and the story it really is and, and the her, magic and the magic yeah and the magic and her growth as a human and yeah. her connections to her past are interwoven in that um so yeah i was i, I never felt like it was gratuitous in any way um right. And so, yeah, I was I was swept up. I was carried along beautifully. A very unique uh, uh, world building I've never seen anywhere else. Um, and it just felt kind of like um, magical realism at time. It's a oh, soft, yes. ma it's yeah. a soft magic system, but uh, I like soft magic systems. And it did feel it didn't feel it never felt um, like it was the magic never solves anything really it, um, it it complicates things more than it than it solves yeah. um but it's it's necessary to the plot and um you know i'm not a big magic guy in my own writing but uh sure. yeah. I, I really i really enjoyed um the level of the magic and that the characters were developed within it and 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 separately from it um and that, that to me really worked well so yeah. Yeah. Wow. Great. Beautiful job. I have to agree. Mesoamerican, uh, very folktale like. At the same time, though, I agree with the magic realism comment uh, in the best possible way. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Loved it. And you're right about the prose as well. Uh, very polished, but at the same time, never very complex. You know, it, 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 it read very quickly for me. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. And uh, I do want to point out that Vaughn is also uh, a uh, self-published fantasy writer. Uh, one of my favorite actual fa self-published fantasies I've ever read is the oh, uh, Sunday right. Nation trilogy. So uh, starting with The Severing Sun. Uh, so go ahead and check out his books, everybody, if you want to support some great historically oriented self-published fantasy. Uh, it's uh, Goths meet Romans in, in a fantasy setting. And it's brilliant. Uh, historical mm -hmm. fantasy, I would call it. Yeah. So next, uh, thank you so much, Vaughn. I, I really think sure. you did a great job. So I don't want to take too much time. I'm going to try to tackle Troll Grave by myself and uh, and say what I loved about it. And hopefully I'll be echoing some of what Matt might have said. Uh, so first, the description. Something stirs in the forest of broken trolls. Despite all his skill in healing and runecraft, Godspeaker Alvir A. Narson could not save everyone. 
In the wake of failure, he seeks aid from an old mentor and witnesses a wave of darkness sweep over the land that for a single moment extinguishes all magic. In the capital, he discovers a fellow god speaker is missing and the streets swarming with windborne, resurrected warriors gifted with supernatural powers by the god's enemies. Answers await in the forest of broken trolls, but within its sinister depths, even the god's protection may not be enough, and no more so than now when the god's strength may be fading and dark powers are on the rise. One thing is, uh, uh, Oliver Einarsson would rather die than let the gods fall. Trollgrave is a standalone Norse fantasy filled with fanatical outlaws, strange magic, and vicious monsters, all of which I can attest is true. <laughs> so this, of course, would be right down my alley as a Norse-inspired fantasy. Uh, if you guys don't know, uh, <laughs> I love Beowulf. I might have mentioned Beowulf a few times in my... Right? <laughs> <laughs> and I love Norse stuff. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things I want to say about this book, it is very well polished. Uh, it, it's a very well written book, uh, epic fantasy. It is kind of dark uh, in a sense, the, what, what's happening in this world. Also in terms of the uh, main character who is also the narrator, it's a first person narration. Um, so Alvir A. Narasan is the narrator and protagonist of this. And Alvir, it, doesn't necessarily come across uh, too strongly here, but I think there are hints of it. This is a guy who has a, a lot of um, personal issues. So this this story was not only an epic fantasy where there are monsters and and dark forests and, and all of that, but it's also a very personal journey, uh, one of a, a person with who's gone through, through some trauma, let's say, and uh, who is trying to heal he is a healer. That's his job, actually, is that uh, when, when it, uh, the term God speaker is essentially one of their primary, they're kind of like priest healers uh, is what they do. Um, and he is a healer, but really the one person he's trying to heal <laughs> and not doing so well at is himself. Um, so this is a really interesting personal journey. There's, uh, I think, uh, some well-handled uh, themes around depression, and uh, but also friendship and family and accepting oneself. Um, so that I appreciated very much uh, during this read was uh, getting to know this character. Um, and uh, yeah, just great stuff. Uh, and also, as I said, well-written, uh, well-polished, some cool uh, monsters and, and baddies in there um, that uh, I had fun reading about um, and some action. Uh, so yeah, uh, and, uh, very inclusive world. It, it's a uh, Norris inspired in, in some ways, but it's also a very inclusive uh, type of fantasy. Uh, so there are queer characters, for example, and queerness is something that is very much accepted uh, in this world. Uh, so that was uh, kind of cool too. Uh, so yeah, I had a good time with this one. Uh, um, Alex Bradshaw, Trollgrave. Uh, highly cool. recommend it, highly recommend it. Cool. And so with that, um, let us proceed. And hopefully Matt would agree with everything I just said. To the Sunset Sovereign, a dragon's memoir. And you may find this uh, written as by a CD, uh, I don't know how to say that, Hook, Hauk, Hauk. But also I, I first saw it as uh, Laura Huey is the name that I first saw it under. I think Laura Huey goes by the pen name CD uh, Hauk or Hook uh, sometimes. It's H-O-U-C-K, however you say that. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, okay. So uh, I'll read the description and then Abel, um, oh, by the way, also, uh, yeah, check out Go Read Books, I wanted to say, because uh, Matt is not here. Uh, wonderful fellow, very supportive of indie fantasy. Okay, so Abel, I'm going to read the description, and then I'm going to have you tell me what you love about the Sunset Sovereign. And You're ready. Also, check out Abel's channel, because he is another fantastic supporter. And by the way, a writer as well, uh, having published in a, his native Italian. But uh, I, I don't know how the translation is going. Abel, can you give us a quick update on the translation of your stories? It's slow and painful. <laughs> 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 but I'm learning a lot. I am having fun doing it. And that's what counts. I'm having yes. fun and it's going well. I'm learning a lot. And I'm loving the language more and more. I'm so in love with English. And by the way, your uh, R 
the way you pronounce Albert, it's so badass. Yeah. <laughs> Because usually American people cannot do that. Cannot exactly how I cannot roll my uh, R on my tongue because yeah. in Italy we don't do that. It's ah. hard for me. It's really hard. So kudos to you. Thank it, you. It, it seems like looking at the Lord of the Rings because those are are so good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I, I learned to really do it when I learned Welsh. Um, and that oh, is yeah. one of the languages that inspired one of the Elvish languages, Sindar, in, in uh, Tolkien's world, in Middle Earth. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Correct connection, perhaps. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> but anyway, I do love rolling my R's. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. Uh, when a dragon finds an assassin sneaking into his lair, he tells her of his life's work and his soon-to-be final chapter. For the past thousand years, the dragon Vakandi has watched the people of Vakfored grow. I, I rolled that one for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> watch the people of Vakfored grow from a wandering band of refugees to a glorious city of art and magic. Under his protection, the city has survived monsters, floods, and wars, all without building an army, dam, or even a wall. But time changes everything, and now the citizens of his beloved city want him dead. Vakandi spends his last day telling his assassin why he loves them and why it's his time to die. Okay, that's a great, I mean, what a premise for a story, right? <laughs> so, exactly. Abel, what did you love about The Sunset Sovereign by Laura Huey? Well, let me say that I think I've been really lucky because until the day before I shot my video announcing my favorite book, I was not sure this was going to be the winner. I had multiple books uh, as runner-ups because <laughs> I had really good books. And, um, and this one, uh, actually this competition forced me to try and be really specific on a rating kind of, of scale because I, I don't do that usually, but I thought I needed that to make <laughs> give the right justice to every writer and to actually position them in the right place. I had actually three books almost on the same level, really, really close. And at the yeah. end, I decided for this one um, because uh, being an author myself, I was fascinated of what of what the author was able to achieve in such a short book. It's it just clock around one hundred and ninety eight pages, so it's, it's a really, really quick read. Short. It's a quick read. Yeah, yeah, if compared to the other, it's the shorter book that I had in my batch, and I think it's the shorter that we all have in our batch generally. And so I was really amazed awesome. at the fact that. He was able to achieve so much in such a short uh, book because the story is complete and it is graciously done because I don't think that the structure would have allowed to give us a, doesn't overstay uh, his welcome. It should have been longer, it would have been a little bit difficult to stomach because of this structure of this dragon telling not exactly his story, but the story of the city yeah. because the, the the novel works this way. He's interested in telling the stories and uh, the story of the city because uh, this assassin, this woman that comes in in his cave, comes from that city, and it is an heartbreaking story in a way because <laughs> it will tell you that the, the the relationship that this dragon had with the city, yeah. It got worse and worse to the point that they, they don't want him anymore. So they, they, they're trying to get rid of it. Yeah. So on, on, a, on, a, on an authorial style, on an authorial point of view, it, it, it's very well uh, thought out. And it's very well executed and very well told. So because of it, it, it is such, such a good achievement and such a difficult things to do. <laughs> and I admired it so much. I decided this was the winner. But I had other stories that were very, very good too. So I, I, I'm a little bit sad that I cannot give you more than one winner, but this one was a winner. Yeah. And then I have to say, to tell you that this dragon is fascinating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in the story, the author actually effectively 
manage to tell you to make you feel how old it is mm. and how complex of a person he is he is it is it's wise it's petty it is petulant sometimes he is prideful but at the same time he's very caring of this of of, of this city uh, the name of the city should tell you that there's a specific relationship between the, the city and the dragon. Yes. And if you read the blurb, you'll see that the city is strange. It didn't go through the same road that all the other city went. That's why it doesn't have walls. That's why it doesn't have armies, because the dragon took care about the city. And he, he gave it the uh, uh, all the citizens the, the possibility to thrive in a completely unique, unique way. Yeah. This was really interesting for me because of the strange and, and really particular character that the dragon is. But at the same time, recounting all of this story, you'll see the, the city and all the people living in there as a, a character in and of itself. Uh -huh. They move organically in a, in a way that is just really understandable. And what, what I appreciated, and maybe this is a way I'm reading the book and maybe nobody else will read it that way, but I've seen it in the way to discuss about uh, parenthood. Of course. Yeah. Uh, I think it's actually, I don't know if Laura Huey is a parent or not, but I read it as <laughs> essentially uh, no. a, deeply, uh, a, a deeply insightful love letter to parenthood. Um, yeah, absolutely yeah. because it effectively tells you how difficult it is yeah. to do what you know you have to do to protect your children yeah. and at the same time try to grow up with them yeah. and to change organically with them you have to remain yourself for a certain amount of things for a certain set of skills and things you have to do to protect them but at the same time you cannot expect them to be exactly what you want them to be. You have to allow them to do what they want to do. And at the same time, you have to try to do your best to allow them to be what they want to do without dying unceremoniously because they're stupid. <laughs> so, <laughs> and the people of the city, they very much are really stupid many times. Yep. So. So Just he like does his best to protect them. <laughs> and, and you'll see that in the way, it's a very bittersweet story. You'll see, you feel for the dragon, but you understand why these people, they really need more freedom. And at the same time, mm. they kind of pay the consequences of the fact that he was so protective with them. So on a thematic level, it is very well done. Very well done. It has a nice pacing. It's short and sweet. Uh, the writing side is, is really clear. The, the other protagonist, the only thing that doesn't work so much is that it's very much an instrument. It, it, it's a device to make the, the story go. So this yeah. dragon needed someone, <laughs> needed a reason to, re to recount the story. So, but it works really nice. And usually I don't like short narrative in any kind i like chunky books <laughs> but the fact that this one was short uh, so short and impact a punch such a powerful punch is a testament to the fact that it was uh, a really good story for me and uh, if i can make a short plug for this please if you're watching this short part of the video go and watch all the other reviews because as i said i am very lucky i had a bunch of really good books even the ones that didn't actually click with me because they were not in subgenres that I usually read or, or they were executed in a way that I really didn't enjoy it at 100%, I recognized that they were, they were good books mm -hmm. and I probably would have never read them because <laughs> without the assignment of being a judge. But go check them out because they deserve attention. You may find a new favorite between those six books. So please do. Very well said, Abel. Thank you so much. You're welcome. The, the cool. next one, and please do check out these wonderful people's channels uh, as well. They're so supportive. Uh, and that goes for my next uh, judge as well. And that is Sam Harrison. Uh is extremely supportive of indie fantasy as well on his channel does some great things uh, i love watching sam's videos so much 
uh, just a wonderful personality that comes across there on the screen. Uh, so please do check out uh, Sam's channel. But uh, And there are links, of course, in the description to all these channels. Um, but I'm going to read uh, about Soul Stealer uh, by L. McKinnerney. I got it, Sam. McKinnerney. Yes. I messed that up the first couple of times so badly. <laughs> and then Sam made me happy in one of his videos because he pronounced it perfectly every time. And I was like, God damn it, how does he do that? And then the last video where he said it, he totally botched it. And I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was so happy. Um, so thank you. I think you must've done that for me, Sam. Um, but anyway. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It wasn't a mistake. Um, it was completely intentional. Yeah. Um, yeah. The time That's when I flubbed it yeah. during the interview with the author, that uh, before we started the recording, I was like, oh, wait, how do I pronounce your surname? <laughs> that was smart. Yeah, I've done that before, too. Anyway, Soul Stealer by L. McKinnerney. The high magic of the Wheel of Time combines with the gritty politics of a Game of Thrones in this thrilling epic fantasy series. Five centuries, three peoples, one war. An endless feud between nations, sorcerers who steal souls to feed their eternal life, a world so broken by magic that those who wield it are shunned and despised. Skilled young hunter Ina hides a deadly secret. She has the dark god's powerful magic, blamed for the genocide of her people five centuries ago. If anyone finds out, they'll execute her. When she learns that her lover's daughter has the same magic, she must decide whether to reveal her secret to save the child. But her decision will determine not only the child's fate, but that of the whole world. Because the cycle of violence has begun again and prophecy decrees, she must be the one to end it. The alternative is the unraveling of all creation. Okay, so uh, that is the description we have in uh, Goodreads. And uh, I, I, I love that it emphasizes Ina there. But there are some other great characters in this book that I'm mm. sure you're going to mention, Sam. So I'll let you go to it. What do you love about Soul Stealer? So um, on the opposite to Abel, which he gave you the shortest book in the selection, and I gave you the. It longest. was very long. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, I, I managed to read very quickly, actually. Um, so uh, I've been quite a slow reader since my daughter was born. Um, I, I was going from, you know, six books a month to like three. Um, however, I absolutely blasted through this one. Um, I think it's very, very, um, very accessible. Um, it's just one of the things that I really prize with um, fantasy stuff is being like, how easy is this to wrap my brain around? And also, I really liked how um, a lot of the um, depth in the world building was quite subtle and it was weaved throughout rather than being like big lore dumps that you would get. Um, and like you were saying, we, we do have Ina, who um, is really great because she is this queer normative character um, in this kind of tribal society. And uh, the author actually told me she's based on Avienda from Wheel of Time. Okay, okay. I can see that, definitely. And the personality as well, yeah. Hmm. So she read Wheel of Time. She was like, why isn't Avienda the protagonist? And this is when she was a teenager. And then, you know, 20 years later, finally wrote the book where Avienda was the protagonist. I love it. Um, yeah. And uh, so she's a really excellent character because she's conflicted between, you know, the, the values of her tribe and also the love that she has for her partner, her lover, um, but also... Her lover is very much in love with not just her, but her husband, as they have this very interesting polyamorous society. Um, and uh, then completely on the other side of the world, we have a much more like medieval England-esque society, which is kind of dealing with the fallout of this basically magical apocalypse from a few hundred years ago. And there's a lot of class divide um, stuff in that one where there's like, you know, there's the rich part of the city and then there's the slums. And uh, our lead POV from there is, is a, a, a priestess called Faye, who was rescued from being a sex worker and being forced into it by her father, by uh, basically the mob boss 
of the city. I think Faye, by the her. way, was probably my favorite character in the book. It was was probably Faye. I I really enjoyed Mine her. Too. Yeah, yours too. Yeah, yeah. And I think um her the supporting character that is with her a lot, Ruard. Um, I have a lot of time for him. I thought he was really interesting. Sure. Um, Elle actually said he was a much bigger part of the original draft of the book. Ah. Um, but he's been shifted into the sequels. Um, Good. I but, like that. I like that character too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so you've got this kind of view of um, a quite grim society that they have there. Um, very much like there are really no squeaky clean good people in that society. Everyone's got something awful in their past or present. And then you finally move on. There's a third uh, POV that, that's the kind of a third major one called Alexios, yes. who is a 200 year old priest who is kind of maybe not a priest actually, but like he's like the the kind of philosophical leader of his tiny hidden village. And so memory storage like a... device too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So basically, when any of any of his descendants die, he absorbs their personality and their memories, yeah. and it allows him to live longer and longer. And he's been chosen basically to keep all of the lore of their society alive, um, as they hide behind illusion magic in a massive forest. Um, and the kind of the the catalyst for the whole story is that this illusion illusion hidden forest city town is uh, besieged by an army of demons and monsters and Alexios ha kind of escapes the town and goes out into the world to try and recruit people to help save it um, and uh, everything kind of uh, falls apart quite miraculously throughout the book um, and I really enjoyed that you, you, you're seeing the like two aspects of the sad society so you're seeing the like more civilized and then you're seeing the more native tribe sort of characters over on the other side of the world um and the and the kind of like forbidden nature of Ina's power and her relationship with Muak who's um her lover's husband was really interesting and you do also get some POV chapters from his point of view which I thought were really strong um, it does one of my favorite things, which is give you POV chapters from people who you kind of want to hate and makes you be like, oh, actually, this is a completely reasonable person in a horrible situation. Um, so, yeah, I, it, it had all the things that I like in books, which is like kind of an antagonist POV. It had this kind of epic world building. It had really interesting magic and it had a lot of stuff that I've um, just really enjoyed overall. So I'll, I'll, I'll pass back to you, Philip. Yeah, wonderful job. Uh, and I agree with you. And I, I would have to say that this is one of the most polished books I've read for SPFBO in the two years I've been judging. It's really well written. Uh, and again, it's my wheelhouse. I love it's. I would describe it as epic fantasy, uh, the mm. um, comparison to Wheel of Time and Game of Thrones. I feel like there is that ambition in this. I've only read this first book. Um, and uh, do you know, hap happen to know, Sam, uh, how many of the books are complete now in this series or... Uh, no, so there's a um, prequel novella which is about to come out. Okay. Um, which is based around one of the uh, magic using characters that's in the like magic university. Okay. Um, and it's kind of like semi prequel, semi leading right into the events of. Okay. Um, and then. Uh, I don't know when the sequel will be out. I think that Elle said next year, um, but I'm definitely very excited to read it. Okay. All right. Very good. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, check them all out, guys. They don't become semi-finalists because, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're uh, no good. Uh, they're here for a reason. Uh, they've already <laughs> gone through uh, a sifting process. So our last one, uh, the last one I read, uh, is uh, ten the tenacious tale of Tana the Tender Sword. This is by Dewey Conway, who is both author and illustrator, because this one has illustrations. 
and Bill Adams, who is the uh, co-author and the editor. Uh, so uh, I will read the description. And then Brian uh, from Belltube, uh, another great channel that you've got to check out if you enjoy having a great time, if you enjoy great insights, if you enjoy uh, having uh, a, a really wonderful, you know, at the end of almost every video, a kind of a what would you call it, Brian? I mean, it, you you give us these wonderful things. It's to sort of a it's sort of a mix of a Mister Rogers moment yeah. and a you're not in it alone type of. A I love segment. it so much. Yeah, yeah. It's one of my favorite parts of your videos, really. Uh, is Thank at the, you. the video. Uh, so yeah, just some a, a time for reflection, uh, a time to be a community. Love it. Um, so Bell Tube, Brian's doing some great things over there, uh, Thank including you. supporting indie fantasy. And so let's see what uh, the tenacious tale of Tana the Tender Sword is about. Galdefort Quillpen has grand dreams of writing epic tales of heroic deeds, just like his famous aunt. Unfortunately, he's been assigned to Tana the Tender Sword, an excruciatingly carefree would-be champion who can't seem to find a qualifying entry-level quest. When things are at their most miserable, the young questers meet an enigmatic old woman who offers Tana a quest. Follow a peg-legged, sword-wielding rooster. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to laugh. <laughs> a peg-legged, sword-wielding rooster to help save a crying mushroom lost within a haunted forest. Tana heroically accepts regardless of how incredibly unsafe the odd quest seems. But Galdefort's fears become reality when a sorceress sends her fog monster and lizard henchmen after them. Only a true champion should confront a sorceress, and in his eyes, Tana is not up to the task. But if he wants to write his chronicle, Galdefort must learn to do something he certainly isn't comfortable doing, trust in honest friendship with Tana the Tender Sword. He's just a chronicler, after all, not a hero. All right, so there's the description. Brian, uh, and as you can see from the description, it's a, a middle grade book. Uh, so, and, and when Philip was looking at his team and he asked himself, who reads at a middle grade level? Um, <laughs> clearly, I was the obvious choice for this book. Okay. It, it was is more a middle... for your sense of fun. Uh, yeah. Nice. So... This is a middle grade book. I do have a physical copy. Uh, this was sent to me by the authors after I had already um, reviewed all the books and announced who my semi-finalist was. And some of the other authors also sent me books. So I actually have this and there's some really cool illustrations. I'm just gonna get this out of the way. Oh, I love before, the illustrations. Before we go, every single chapter has a small doodle illustration to it, but then there's also some really fun ones there as well. So the tenacious tale of Tana the Tender Sword. When I looked at the six books that Dr. Chase provided me, I would have not thought that this would have been the, the semifinalist for me. A couple of reasons. One of the books was a lit RPG book. And if you've watched my channel much at all, you know, I read a ton of lit RPG. So it just kind of wound up in my lap that there was that. One of the books was based on the Highlander lore, you know, Connor McLeod of the Clan McLeod, Duncan McLeod of the Clan McLeod. I am a huge Highlander fan. I have a ton of Highlander books back there, you know, on the bookshelves. So when I was reviewing this list and what books that, you know, I was going to be reading, I absolutely never thought in a billion years that a middle grade book would be the one that I put through. This book does so many things so well. It it's it's perfect for middle grade. There's lessons in it that talk about, you know, in terms of theme, where we have obviously we have friendship that kind of goes through the ringer a little bit between Galdefort and Tana. And this story is really told from Galdefort's point of view as he's chronicling the tale of Tana, the Tender Sword. And she's called the Tender Sword because that's rank one. And I kind of got it wrong when I did my review of this on my channel, saying that they were already out of school and now they're going on quests. I think as I've gone back and read it a little bit, and that should tell you how much I love the book, because I never reread anything ever, period. 
I, it seems like they're almost like on a either a semester break or maybe it's the end of year one. And now they have to go out into the world and get their very first quest using the skills and the abilities that they were taught so far in school. So we have themes of friendship. We have themes of overcoming obstacles. We have themes of what is our goal and what do we do when they go sideways? Because I think if you're a middle grader, that's going to be something really important to have some idea about. And I think that that's really the beauty of storytelling and that we can get these life lessons across in a fun and an engaging way, you know, through the magic of a fantasy story. And so while it is for middle grade, this absolutely has been the most fun book I've read all year long. I had an absolute blast with this because there's so much in there to love as an adult. And I think if you are somebody that has younger kids or younger nieces and nephews, and you want to share a story with them, this is a great one. There's no, nobody dies. There's no blood. There's no gore. There's no over the top anything. There's certainly no sex, anything like that. This is a middle grade book. I think the worst that happens is maybe somebody gets knocked unconscious and they get away because, you know, they got a free moment to do that. But I just, I really, really loved how we have, like I said, our, our POV character, Galdefort, is sort of, I think the best word to say it is he's very insecure. He's unsure about how to be a chronicler. And it's even tougher because his aunt is the world's most renowned chronicler. So he's and he's a bit of a he's a bit of a curmudgeon, isn't he? He is. He's he's like this young kid who's just, you know, already <laughs> feels like he's, you know, 55 years old with three ex-wives and you know, 18 mortgages already. <laughs> Um, and he's like probably like 11 or 12, but yeah, he is a bit of a curmudgeon and Tana who is chronicling is the absolute opposite. I mean, she is just a ball of fire, miss optimistic on everything. And, you know, without giving too much away about the book or the plot, you know, it's, this is really about them getting their first quest, but that does go South. And instead of it being a real basic level quest, they get basically, thrown into having to do something that only a true champion, not some first level quester would be asked to do. And they're caught in the middle of it and they have to figure out a way to make it work. And like Philip talked about, there's an awesome animal companion who is a rooster with a peg leg who wields a peg leg sword. Um, it's just, <laughs> it's just a ton of fun. And I, when I finished this book, I put this down and I said, this is exactly what I personally needed right now is a middle-aged person. I know that it's going to help middle grade readers want to get into fantasy because it's, it's, you know, it's not like super basic there. There's challenging stuff to think about, but I think that that's good. It's, it's encouraging young readers to get into fantasy. And I just, the sensibilities of it all, was perfect. In terms of length, it was exactly the right length for me. It wasn't too short. It wasn't too long. The cast is extremely tight. We are basically following uh, Galdefort and Tana through different interactions with different people, but it's always basically the two of them together. And we see that bond change over the book mm -hmm. where Galdefort is a little bit, you know, maybe insecure and maybe Tana is a little bit over secure. If that's, a, that's Philip, you're the doctors. It's not a word. Um, it is now. It is a word. We invent words all the time on my channel. She's a little over secure. He's a little under into secure. And they kind of like do this a little bit where she starts having these weird doubts that when she, when we first meet her, she's so bombastic. We don't think she's going to ever have any doubts about anything at all. But as these challenges get thrown at her, which are, way out of her league she gets that little self-doubt that insecurity and then all of a sudden galdefort is there to pick her up and i just think that these are really great lessons for middle grade and i, I like i said I, I i read crazy amounts of dense material and hard books so for me to put a middle grade book through for me this book had to be really really good and it is it's absolutely one of my favorite reads this year so far um 
I'm gushing about it because it's great. It's just yeah. it does it does what it's supposed to do and more. It definitely exceeded my expectations. Although, like I mentioned, I didn't really have much expectation. I thought a middle grade book just kind of got into the lottery and okay, I'll read it. But very, very happily and pleasantly surprised by this. All right. That's my gush fest. That was well done. Well done. That uh, We love the gushes around here. So, yeah. Yeah. I hope I didn't talk over you too much. No, no, you're great. Uh, I, I appreciate all of four of you. Um, and again, um, I'm sorry, Matt couldn't be here, but he really is attending to something very important. Uh, so I hope I did represent Trollgrave well. Uh, but thank you so much, all four of you, for, for doing this. Uh, I am so appreciative uh, once again. Um, but now it is time. I can't put it off. I have to do this. And it's, believe me, it was very difficult. Uh, you guys gave me some great reads. So thank you for that as well. But I do have to make my choice. And uh, it is clear to me, at least. Um, I, I do have a, a very strong sense of what uh, I think um, not only deserves to be the uh, our, our finalist, and I hope that everybody will get behind it and check it out as well. Um, but uh, I feel like it, it could easily win the whole competition. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. I don't know. I mean, obviously, all the other groups are putting forward uh, some amazing books as well. So I just hope people will support these uh, these semifinalists and finalists and, 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 and so on. And if you look at the reviews that uh, my friends here have done, they've done some spectacular reviews of not just their semifinalists, but the other books that they've read. Uh, so yeah, check those out um, as well. But here it is, guys. Um, I don't know. I feel like there should be a drum roll or something, but, um, you know. <laughs> and our finalist is going to be The Tenacious Tale of Tana the Tender Sword. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I agree with everything that Brian said. And uh, furthermore, <laughs> Brian, furthermore, I have to say one thing about Tana, which is that uh, she so reminds me, and I never thought I would say this in my life, but she so reminds me of Luffy from One Piece. Uh, very similar spirit uh, and just uh, undefeatable, in, at least in her own mind. Uh, and uh, I, I loved the dynamic between her and Galdefort. Uh, you have the ultimate odd couple here, uh, him with his grumpy, curmudgeonly, you know, um, kicking the rock on the ground and, and grumbling under his breath all the time and her with her just yeah, absolutely expressive exuberance uh and her 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 love her zest for life uh these two were just wonderful together i mean it's just comedy gold and at the same time i think this is a book that uh, uh, yes a, a young reader would love but also an adult uh, because there are some really great themes in here about friendship and uh, about, it, it's interesting because there was some meta commentary even about storytelling in here, because uh, he is a chronicler. And the role of a storyteller in relation to their hero was something that gets visited a lot in the story. So there's some kind of sophisticated uh, theme work and commentary going on in the story as well. So it works on these different levels, For sure. which I found to be some of the greatest stories of all time are stories that are you know, like A Wizard of Ursi was written for children, right? Okay, but you know, anyone who's read it knows that that is a very adult story as well. Uh, you think about some of our, our favorite stories and, and they are stories that can be enjoyed on, on different levels. So I really appreciated how well this was put together. Shout out to uh, uh, the uh, illustrations as well. They added to the fun, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, I was also um, surprised. <laughs> and, yeah. and, I am not a middle grade book reader, okay? That's not my wheelhouse, but I feel like, you know, when we as judges approach this and we do our very best uh, to be respectful of every book, every read, but um, at the same time, I try my best uh, to put aside my own preferences, to put aside my biases to the degree that I can and say, how well does this book accomplish what it is setting out to do? And all of these books do that magnificently. Um, but uh, I believe that uh, Brian is correct in that uh, the tenacious tale of Tana, the tender sword really hits it out of the park in a way that uh, I'm surprised, honestly, that uh, maybe they wanted to go this route, self-publishing. I don't know. I, I'm surprised that a, uh, a traditional publisher would not have picked this up. 
uh, frankly. Uh, I think these guys, well, I know these guys are very humble uh, because uh, after my video came out that said that they were going to be my semifinalists, they were, I mean, they were utterly stunned, stupefied. Um, I, I just, I was like, I don't think you guys know what you have. And uh, well, maybe now they do. Maybe they do. Um, I honestly don't know if Smithbow has had a middle grade book. I'm sure it must have happened before. Um, be a, a finalist. Um, I don't think one has certainly ever won the contest. Um, but let's see. Let's see. Uh, but it is going to be our finalist, uh, and I'm I, I'm actually very at peace and happy about that. Uh, but uh, I still want to thank uh, all my other four uh, judges who have played such a vital role in this. Thank you for giving me such a wonderful read. Uh, thank you for all the work you did and spreading the word about these beautiful stories. Uh, you all did such good work, uh, and it's a privilege to uh, have worked with you. So please support these wonderful people. Check out their channels and. Uh, Check out these wonderful stories, everybody. Um, so sure. we will, uh, I'll be back uh, in, next year to discuss uh, the other finalists, which I will be reading with great interest. Uh, any of you guys who want to follow along with me and read them as well, um, I'm very happy to have you along. Um, but your, uh, your, uh, your duties uh, are now accomplished. Um, so, and you did a marvelous job. So thank you so much. And everybody, until next time.